Have you ever been afraid to talk about the gospel with someone? Ever worried that uh, if you said the wrong thing, maybe you would just turn someone away from Christ? So instead, you just remained silent and said nothing? Have you ever not prayed in public before a meal for, offend, uh, for fear of offending someone? Have you ever kept silent about your faith because you didn't want to be made fun of or alienated in any way? Have you ever been ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I think most of us have at least one time in our life acted in a way that would suggest that we were somehow just a little bit ashamed of the gospel. Because the reality is we live in a culture that mocks and belittles Christ and those who follow him. Most of us have a desire to fit in. We have a desire to be liked by others. And sadly, at times, we can cave into that desire and we can keep what we know to be true about Jesus to ourselves so that we won't offend or stand out from the crowds. The temptation to keep silent, to be ashamed of the gospel, is not something that's new in our day. It's the same struggle that believers of every generation have encountered. Those in the first century also lived in a day where society was incredibly hostile to Christ. Jews and Gentiles alike were mocked, they were belittled, they were persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the Roman culture embraced all sorts of pagan idolatry and accepted it as equally valid expressions of faith. But they found Christianity despicable and foolish. Like that's always been the way of the world. They will accept almost any religious belief as valid except for the truth of Christianity. Archaeologists have discovered in Rome a drawing that was dated to the second century. It depicted the scorn that Roman society had for Christians in general. It showed a man bowing before a cross with a donkey upon the cross. And the caption read, Alexamenos worships his God. Obviously, the artist was mocking this man. He was making fun of him and Christianity, comparing the worship of Jesus Christ to that of a donkey. That type of ridicule, that mocking that existed from the earliest days in Rome still exists in our society today. Now, the Roman culture was especially resistant to the gospel because we as believers worship Jesus, the one who was crucified. And crucifixion was despised by the Romans. In fact, it was so brutal, it was so despised that Roman law normally forbid a Roman citizen from being crucified. Yet the very heart of the gospel is that Jesus was crucified us. He died one of the most humiliating deaths possible. We receive salvation by putting our faith in the one who was crucified. We worship the one who died upon the cross. To a Roman, such a concept was appalling. How could anyone worship someone who was humiliated to the point of death by crucifixion? It was foolishness. It was absurd. You would never worship someone who had that kind of weakness to be crucified. Yet this is the message, the truth that Paul proclaimed to all who would listen. This is the message, the gospel that he wrote about in his letter to the Roman believers, a group who were surrounded by those who thought they were fools for worshiping the crucified Jesus Christ. The world has always mocked and belittled those who place their faith in the God of the Bible. They did it in Rome. And they do it in Medford today. We know we should not be ashamed of the gospel, but so often the pressure to fit in can overwhelm us and we can remain silent. If you've ever done that, if you've ever remained silent when you know you should have spoken up, been ashamed of the gospel, there is good news for us this morning in the passage we will be looking at. Because our passage reminds us of two truths that if we will remind ourselves of, if we will keep at the forefront of our mind, it will prevent us from ever being ashamed of the gospel message again. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We continue on our study of the book of Romans this morning, and we pick it up where we left off last week with verse 16. And as we do, we read this. Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. See, Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. He took every opportunity to proclaim the truth of the gospel message, no matter where he went, no matter how he was received or treated by those he was preaching to. And here, Paul shares with us 
what it was that compelled him to feel that way, what it was that compelled him to never be ashamed of the truth. And knowing the truth of what he says here is how Paul stood firm and was able to preach the truth. So we want to look very carefully at these verses this morning. For here is the key for how it is that we, like Paul, may proclaim that I am not ashamed of the gospel. And Paul provides us with the first reason that he was not ashamed in verse 16. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it saves all who believe. Look again at what he says in verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The first reason that Paul provides of why it is that he was not ashamed of the gospel is because the gospel is God's power to save us. The word translated power here in the Greek is dunamis. It means power, ability, it means miracle. We get our word dynamite from this word. When it's used of God in the New Testament, it describes his mighty power, his, you could say, explosive power, his power to do that which is beyond our explanation. It describes his ability to do miracles. In fact, we could even accurately translate this, the gospel is the miraculous power of God for salvation. And that describes what salvation is. Salvation is indeed a miracle. It's something that is beyond our comprehension, beyond our ability to perform. It's even beyond our ability to fully explain. And Paul makes a fascinating statement here. He says, the gospel is the power of God. He doesn't say the gospel is about the power of God. He doesn't say it explains the power of God. He doesn't even say it reveals the power of God. He says the gospel is the very power of God. The gospel message itself is a supernatural, miraculous power. It is the means by which God brings to salvation all who have faith in him. See, the gospel itself is the very miracle of God. It is a miraculous power of God because it does what we cannot do. It brings us to salvation. The gospel is God's power for it reveals how a sinful man can be saved. We, how we can be saved from the just punishment of our sin that we deserve and instead receive salvation. The gospel is God's power. It's his only means by which we can be saved. Nothing else can save men from an eternity in hell. Nothing else. No other message is ever said to be the power of God for salvation. Only the gospel. Now, the term salvation here is clearly a reference to being rescued from the penalty and the power of sin. The way in which God saves us from our punishment is through the gospel. And by using the term salvation here, Paul is reminding us of the reality that we as human beings are in trouble. We must have a serious need if God needed to do something to save us. You know, we would not normally talk about saving someone from a day at Disneyland unless that would be torment for you, and then maybe we would need to save you. But for most of us, that would not be something you would need to be saved from. To be saved from something clearly implies that you are in a bad situation, that you are in need of being rescued or saved. And the gospel message explains that we are in a bad situation and we need to be saved. The power of God to accomplish our salvation, our rescue, is the gospel. Now, remember the word gospel itself means good news. And when it is used in the New Testament, gospel refers to the good news about Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus Christ is that he was born of a virgin and lived a perfect life. That he being fully man and fully God died upon the cross in our place. The good news is that he died to pay the penalty for our sins and he was resurrected on the third day. But to understand why the death of the eternal Son of God is good news, we must understand the bad news that we were born sinners. We must understand that as sinners we stand condemned before God. And if one does not understand the reality of the bad news, that we have rebelled against our Creator and we deserve to spend an eternity in hell for our rebellion, then the good news of the Gospel makes no sense. I think if we are honest with ourselves, this is often why we are ashamed of the gospel, even if we don't vocalize it. Because we don't want to talk about the bad news. We don't want to tell a friend that they are headed for hell. We know that telling someone who is close to us that they are living in rebellion to God, that they are headed for damnation unless they change their ways, can be rather infuriating to the one who hears the message. Because it is rather offensive to hear that my best is not good enough for God. It's rather offensive to hear that I cannot earn salvation. It is something that must be received as a gift 
from God alone. It's offensive to hear that I can never be good enough on my own. In fact, all of my good deeds actually just offend God even more. The gospel is an offensive message because it declares that we in ourselves can never be good enough. And no matter what we do on our own strength, we will be punished eternally for the sinful deeds that we have done. Yet this is what the scripture declares is truth. And we must never be ashamed about sharing the horror and the reality about sin. Because if we don't explain why men need salvation, then the good news of the gospel makes absolutely no sense. The good news is that we were sinners bound for hell, but there is a way of escape. There is a way in which we can receive the gift of salvation and have eternal life through Jesus Christ. But if we don't know that we are sinners, then we don't know that we need to be saved. If we don't know the bad news, the good news just makes no sense. Imagine for a moment that you are at your next annual checkup with your family doctor. Doctor hands you a bottle of pills and says you must take one of these pills every day. Your life will be better, your life will be happier if you take them, so take these pills. Now, as you leave the office, you may well reason that my life is already good enough, so I don't see the need to take these pills, and you neglect your doctor's advice. But what if your doctor were to tell you the full story of why it is that you needed to take those pills? What if he were to explain to you that you have a rather serious illness? And if you fail to take a pill each day, you will die a most horrendous and painful death. Well, if he explained that, it would put taking those pills in a little bit different light. You would realize the need for the pill, the consequences of not taking it. See, the good news of the saving nature of those pills is only understood in light of the bad news and the seriousness of your disease. So it is with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must understand the reality that we need a Savior if we are to appreciate and receive gratefully the gift that He has offered to us. In fact, that's why starting here in verse 18 and then going until the end almost of chapter 3, Paul is going to expound upon the human condition. He's going to deal with how serious sin is. He explains in great detail how desperately humanity needs salvation. And we'll be exploring our need for a Savior in great detail as we study these upcoming verses and chapters. For now we observe the reality that the gospel message speaks about sin should never cause us to be ashamed of the gospel message. Because while the gospel explains the seriousness of sin, it also provides the cure for our sin and our disease. And that's why we ought to never be ashamed of the gospel message. For it's not just about condemning people for the sake of condemning people. That's not why we talk about sin. It doesn't just explain that we are all sinners, it provides the cure. The gospel, the way of salvation, is the power of God to those who are dying. So how can we ever be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is the single means by which people can be saved for all eternity from the payment of their sin. Imagine you were on the deck of a ship and you're watching someone drowning in front of you. And you happen to have a life preserver in your hands and you just need to toss it to that person and they'll be saved. But you're concerned that if you toss that life preserver to them, you might offend them. Because to throw a life preserver to someone implies that they can't help themselves. It implies that you don't think they're a very good swimmer and they need a little extra assistance here. And you certainly don't want to offend the drowning person. What if by throwing the life preserver to them, you so offend them that they never speak to you again? So instead you stand there and you watch them drown waiting for them to ask for help, and then you will toss them a life preserver, but not before. Now, obviously, that's an absurd illustration. If you saw someone drowning, you would throw them a life preserver. You wouldn't be ashamed of such an action. You would take whatever means necessary to save the one who is perishing before you. The reality is that's the same mentality we ought to develop when it comes to sharing the gospel with others. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It is the life preserver for all humanity. And the scripture tells us that the reality is every person is drowning spiritually on their own. They cannot make it on their own. Every person needs to be saved. And that's what the gospel is. It is the means by which God saves lost people. Being ashamed of the gospel is just as absurd as being ashamed of tossing someone a life preserver who is drowning. We should never be ashamed of the gospel. It is the way by which all can be saved. 
See, the gospel is not just our personal opinion on something. It's not just our personal belief system that we have adopted. It is the very power of God, and it's the means of salvation for all who believe. And so we ought never be ashamed of sharing His power with others. Notice the last phrase of verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, the way that people are saved is by faith. The Greek word that's translated believe here is pistuo. It's a common word used in the New Testament for faith. It means to believe, to trust, to have faith, to put your complete reliance in someone. And this is the word that's used over and over and over again in the New Testament to refer to how we receive the gift of salvation that is offered to us by our Lord. It is through faith alone, by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, biblical faith, pistuo, is not just agreeing that facts are true. It's putting our trust, it's putting our reliance in the person of Jesus Christ. In order to be saved, to be rescued from our sins, we must believe in the Lord Jesus. When the jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. See, salvation comes not in what we do, not by being baptized, not even by going to church, not even by avoiding sin and living righteously. Salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Saving faith in the Bible contains three elements. First, it contains knowledge. That is, we must know some essential facts. We've got to know who Jesus is, and we need to know what He has done. We must know that Jesus is God, that He died on the cross, and He arose again on the third day. We must know what the Bible tells us, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And second, there's another aspect of faith, and that's what's called assent. That is, we must agree to the truth about the facts that we know. Now, assent is not enough. Just to agree what the Bible says is true is not enough to be saved. Because as James declares, even the demons believe that much and shudder. Just agreeing in the truthfulness of the gospel is not enough to be saved, but it is a necessary aspect of what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. There's a third aspect of faith, and that is a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, a person must not only understand the facts, must not only agree that they are true, they must bow before Jesus Christ, humbly putting their trust in His atoning work done upon the cross. To believe in Jesus Christ is to put your trust in Him alone for salvation, is to receive what He did in your place and to trust in Him alone. And when we put that faith, when we put that trust in Jesus Christ, then Jesus becomes our personal Lord and Savior. And when that happens, we are forever transformed and we are saved from the penalty of our sins. And we are reminded here that this incredible gift of faith is available to all people. It's for both Jew and Greek. Now, Greek there is a way of referencing anybody that's non-Jewish. And so when Paul says this, he is highlighting that the gospel is available to all. Now he says to the Jew first. That is simply highlighting the chronological order in the way in which the gospel message was preached to all people. It was offered first to the Jewish nation. They were God's specially chosen people. Jesus was Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. It came to Israel first. But then it was offered to all people of all languages, of all backgrounds. Every person, regardless of their racial heritage, has the opportunity to be saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul was not ashamed of the gospel, because it saves all who come by faith. None are excluded. So we never need to be ashamed as we share the truth of the gospel that perhaps someone we will be speaking to might be excluded. We have the life preserver to a drowning world, and it's available to all, all who come to Him in faith. And when we realize the reality of this truth, then we, like Paul, will be able to truthfully say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For how can we ever be ashamed of the message that brings hope to those who are dying? How can we be ashamed to share the way that provides salvation to those who are perishing? How can we be ashamed of offering a message that is equally available to all people free of charge. Once we grasp this truth, we will never be ashamed of the gospel again. But Paul continues to share a second reason why he was not ashamed of the gospel. Because it shows us the righteousness of God. Look at verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel because it reveals the righteousness of God. 
The term righteousness there in the Greek is dikasune. It means righteousness. It means that which is just, that which is right. Now, the word righteousness can be used several different ways in the Scripture. It can be used to describe God's attribute. God is a righteous God, meaning that He always does what is right. He always does what is just. It can also be used to refer to God's power and that He is faithful, He is righteous to keep His promises. In fact, that's the way the Old Testament often refers to the righteousness of God in the context that He is the one who faithfully keeps His promises to save His people. Righteousness can also be used to describe those who have been declared to be in a right relationship with God by God Himself. Believers are those who are said to have been declared righteous, those who are in a right relationship with God. And there is a sense here in which Paul uses this phrase, this the righteousness of God, really to encompass all of those meanings. The righteousness of God refers to his attribute of being righteous. It refers to his act of saving his people. It's the way in which he has declared believers to be righteous. Paul is referring to the righteousness that comes from God alone and how he imputes his righteousness to those who have faith in him. See, the gospel reveals the way a righteous God brings a sinful people into a right relationship with himself. Now, the Bible is very clear that none of us on earth ever achieve perfection. We all sin. In fact, James reminds us we all stumble. All of us do. When the Bible talks about us as believers being righteous, it does not mean perfection. It means that we have been placed into a right relationship with God through the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. The word translated revealed here is apocalypto. It means to disclose or to make something fully known. The gospel makes the righteousness of God fully known. It shows us how a holy God can be in a relationship with sinful humanity. See, his righteous character is revealed through the cross because full payment was made for our sins. He did what was right and what was just. Since penalty was paid in full, justice was served at the cross. His righteousness is revealed in how he fulfilled all of his promises in the Old Testament scripture to save humanity and provide a way of salvation. His righteousness is revealed in that he made a way for us by giving us the righteousness of Christ. The wonder of the gospel message is that we who are sinners have been declared innocent of our sin. This is the revelation of the gospel, that the righteousness that belongs to God is imputed, it is given to every believer at the moment we put our faith in Him. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3.9, may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of of faith. See, Paul declares that the righteousness that we are given by God isn't based upon what we do, but in the one in whom we have believed. And at the moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are given the righteousness that comes from God alone. We who are by nature vile sinners are declared by the righteous judge of the universe as innocent of all wrongdoing. And we are forevermore treated as if we had lived Christ's sinless and perfect life we get His righteousness credited to our account in full. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We have been declared righteous by our Lord. That's what the gospel message reveals. This declaration is something that God alone does for us. He has said that we are righteous and He has declared us just before Him through Christ. See, the gospel is all about His righteousness, not our own. The gospel reveals that we could never earn salvation, and so He purchased it. The gospel message reveals that we need His righteousness to enter His presence, and so He gives it to us. It's about His righteousness. It's not about anything we earn. We ought to let this truth grab our hearts and minds. The gospel reveals God's righteousness. The gospel is a God-centered message, and it's for His glory, and it's for His praise. And when we begin to truly grasp that truth, the wonder of the revelation of His righteousness that is in the gospel message, then we will never be ashamed of the gospel again. Now, notice how righteousness of God is revealed. It's revealed from faith to faith. 
Now, that phrase has been interpreted any number of ways. And depending upon the English translation you have, you will read a variety of ways to translate it. Some say from faith to faith, from faith for faith, from start to finish by faith, by faith entirely, and a host of other ways of trying to translate this phrase. The variety of translations reflects a variety of opinions as to what Paul meant by the use of the prepositions here. Now, grammatically, any number of these translations is possible. But I think the best understanding of this, of this phrase would be to translate it as the righteousness of God is revealed from start to finish by faith. See, Paul uses this phrase from faith to faith to emphasize the reality that the righteousness of God is revealed by faith and by faith alone. Dr. J. Burnham McGee put it this way, God saves you by faith, you live by faith, you die by faith, and you'll be in heaven by faith. That's what he is telling us here by this phrase. Paul is reminding us that we first receive the gospel by faith, and we go on living by faith every day thereafter. God's righteousness is revealed to us only by faith. It comes from faith in Him. It continues as we grow in our faith day by day. See, the emphasis here is that faith is not a one-time act. Now, certainly there is a point in time where you go from death into life, where you first place your faith in Jesus Christ. But then that faith will continue to grow our entire lives. In fact, that's clarified by what Paul says next. He says, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. That's a quote from Habakkuk 2.4. Now, Habakkuk 2.4 is a rather important verse in the Scripture. It's quoted here. It's quoted in Galatians 3.11. It's quoted in Hebrews 10.38. This single phrase is repeated four times in the Scripture. The righteous shall live by faith. Or if you have a King James, the just shall live by faith. We obviously need to understand what this means because it's a rather important concept in the Scripture. In Habakkuk, the entire verse reads like this. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him but the righteous will live by his faith. In the context of this passage, God is responding to Habakkuk. He's, expl he's explaining that a man's heart condition is revealed by his actions. Those who are living pridefully reveal that their heart is not right, but the righteous one is also evident by their actions. For the righteous one, a true believer, will live by faith. To live by faith means that we seek to live our lives honoring the Lord alone. To live by faith is a description of all true believers. We are those who live by faith. We show what we believe by the actions in our day-to-day -day lives. Paul put this in 2 Corinthians 5, 6. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. That phrase, to walk by faith and not by sight, it's another way of saying we live by faith. We seek to, no matter what we do in our lives, to live to be pleasing to the Lord alone. This is the essence of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. This is what it means to walk by faith. We obey Him, not because we are seeking to earn righteousness, because we understand we can never earn His righteousness. We say no to sin and we say yes to obedience to God's word, not because we think we're better than someone else, not because we're trying to earn brownie points or rewards. We do it, we walk by faith because it's our ambition to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Those who have been declared righteous by God walk by faith. That's what we do and this is why we do it. It was true for the Old Testament saint, it is true for the New Testament saint. Salvation has always been by God's grace through faith. And that faith transforms us and causes us to seek to live lives that are pleasing to Him. And our faith is the means by which God saves us. It's not our works. The principle that one's faith is evident in actions is quoted here as support for what Paul has just said. That our entire lives as believers are characterized by faith. See, faith in the Lord is never a one-time act and then we return to our past lives of sin. Faith in the Lord transforms us. It is the means by which God's righteousness is revealed. And when we have been declared righteous by God, it changes us. The righteous live by faith, and we will live by faith the rest of our days. See, this concept that the righteous shall live by faith is core to the biblical message. We who have been declared righteous by God will live lives of faith. It is God who declares us as righteous. 
It doesn't say the righteous will live by our works. It doesn't say we can achieve righteousness if we work really, really hard at it. Rather, it says we who are already declared righteous, which is something only God can declare, we are those who will live by faith. This is why Paul was never ashamed of the gospel, because he lived by faith. He lived for an audience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ. The reality is when we are fearful to share the gospel, it means that we are living for the approval of men and not the approval of our Lord. When we desire to be liked or popular or accepted and we change our behavior based on who it is we're trying to please. But if we realize that there is only one who has declared us to be righteous, and that is God, that we are called to live by faith each and every day, living for him alone, then we will never be ashamed of the gospel again. For we are living for his glory, not our own. These two verses, Romans, is what the Lord used to transform the life of Martin Luther. Martin Luther lived in the 1500s. He was aware that the Lord demanded his followers to live righteously. But the more Luther tried to live righteously, the more he became aware that he couldn't. He worked and worked and worked to try to please God. But the more he tried to, the more he realized he was falling short of God's perfection and righteousness. In fact, Luther would later write that he secretly began to hate God because the standard of righteous living that he saw in the scripture he found impossible in his own strength to maintain and he began to hate God for doing that. But then one day, Luther discovered the truth of these verses, Romans 1, 16 and 17. He realized that the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, that it's available to all as a free gift to those who place their faith in Christ. He realized that we as humans cannot earn righteousness. It's something that we can only receive by God's gracious hand, by faith as it is revealed in the gospel. He realized that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we can rest in Christ knowing that he has done it all. And the righteous live by faith, not by works. When Luther finally realized this amazing truth, he was instantly transformed. He put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. He stopped putting his faith in his own achievements and his own works. And at that moment, he was saved, and his life and church history was never the same. If you are here this morning and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then I urge you to consider doing so today. Perhaps you've tried to live a righteous life like Luther did, and you have found it impossible to do. That's good because it is impossible to do. It is impossible to be righteous in our own strength. The righteous live by faith and not by works. And the only way to be saved, to be declared righteous, is by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and allowing His righteousness to fill our hearts and transform us so that we walk each day by faith and not by sight. And if you'd like to talk to somebody more about that, please see me after the service. Luther lived his life just like Paul did, unashamed of the gospel because he got the message of Romans 1, 16 and 17. He understood the precious truth of these two verses. This is the way that we can all live lives never being ashamed again of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to realize that it is the gospel that saves all who believe. It is God's only way of salvation and it is available to all. When we realize that it is the gospel that shows the righteousness of God and it reveals how it is that we can be declared righteous before him. I encourage you to meditate on this passage in the week ahead. Let the truth of these verses sink deep into your heart and mind. Because when we believe these truths deeply, then we, like Paul, can honestly proclaim each and every day, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let us pray.